Now, I remember uh, as we look at the White House, a Maureen Dowd column talking about presidencies and uh, sort of paraphrased what John Lennon said, if life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. The same thing with presidents. Uh, they never know what's going to hit them when they come into the office. And I suspect Joe Biden never expected a couple days ago he'd be going out saying that the top issue right now that he's facing, that Americans are facing, is inflation. Uh, and that's obviously uh, what a lot of people are talking about on the opinion pages and our must-reads. And here's some takes. Uh, Catherine Rampell writes for The Washington Post that Democrats ignore the recent inflation numbers at their own peril. Quote, President Biden has limited tools available for dealing with inflation, and it seems unwise to promise his agenda will do more to reduce prices than it actually can. In any case, price stability is supposed to be the purview of the Federal Reserve. Unfortunately, the Fed's most obvious tool for tamping down inflation, rising interest rates, risks throwing the economy back into recession. When Democrats tell voters they should stop whining about inflation, that such worries are imagined, they do themselves no favors either. They must head into the midterms with a clear-eyed view of the economy as it is, not as they wish it to be. And this from Paul Krugman. He writes in the New York Times that history says don't panic about inflation. Quote, what does history teach us about the current inflation spike? One lesson is that brief episodes of overheating don't necessarily lead to 1970s type stagflation. 1946 through 48 didn't cause long term inflation and neither did other episodes that most resemble where we are now. World War I and the Korean War. And we really should have some patience. Given what happened in the 1940s, pronouncements that inflation can't be transitory because it has persisted for a number of months are just silly. So yes, that was an ugly inflation report. And we hope the future looks better uh, than it looks now. But people making knee-jerk comparisons with the 1970s and screaming about stagflation are looking at the wrong history. When you look at the right history, it tells you not to panic. Uh, Gene Robinson, of course, mm -hmm. you've written a great column about inflation yourself. Uh, tell us your take. Well, look, I, you know, I, um, the economists can make their, their case on either side of the question of whether it is or is not transitory. I, I think politically, uh, I think the, the President Biden and the White House had better worry about inflation because I think inflation is political poison and, and particularly rising gas prices. Um, I, it's something that everybody sees, everybody feels. It's, it's on billboards as you drive down, you know, down, the, down the street and, and you see, you know, gas costing, you know, a buck twenty more or a gallon uh, than it did last year, uh, and, uh, and and people notice that and they're upset about it, and and they look toward uh, the, the the administration. They look toward the the president and the, and the White House and the administration and Congress uh, to do something about it. And and I think the party in power uh, is it, it potentially will pay a price. And so I think um, uh, this administration has to be seen to. Take it inflation seriously, uh, not just say you know you're imagining this or, or don't worry about it. And in fact, yes, people worry about it because they're paying more, um, and and they should be seen to do something about it, to try to do something about it. You know, open the uh, you know release some some oil from the strategic reserve, um, uh, do things. Uh, I just think politically that's the that's the path uh, I would take if if I were advising the White House. Clear, uh, if, if you're senator uh, in, in, right now and you have gas prices going up 50 percent, energy prices going up 30 percent, food prices going up, uh, what do you do? Uh, what do you tell your other colleagues? Well, I think um, it's really important that Democrats take not just these inflationary numbers, but also what happened in Virginia and really do a gut check here. I think the Democrats, I think all of us got so carried away with how bad Trump was that we thought that as a primary talking point was going to be enough to get those voters who voted for Donald Trump and Joe Biden 
uh, get them to stay in our column. And I think this stuff is really dangerous, and I couldn't agree more with Gene about the gas prices. There are some things the president can do about the gas prices in terms of the petroleum reserve. And, you know, I, I don't think we spend enough time talking about how we got towards energy independence under the Obama administration. It wasn't Trump. And I think um, turning an eye towards that, the, the oil pipelines and what's going on in terms of the refineries and what's going on in terms of gas prices. Uh, I think Joe Biden needs to spend some time on that subject and not ignore it because there's no way that those voters in the suburbs are not paying attention to what, what the, the credit card receipt says when they fill their tank. And it could be brutal for the Democrats next year if something doesn't happen to bring those prices back down. And by the way, uh, for anybody who thinks uh, that when those gas prices go up, they're thinking, hey, this is Donald Trump's fault, they're just not. They're blaming Joe Biden. They're blaming the Democrats. They're blaming the party in power. Uh, and so, so, and, and Claire, Claire brings up great points. I, I agree with Gene, too. You know, Bill Clinton would throw everything at the wall that he could when gas prices started to go up. Hillary Clinton, her 2008 campaign, when she started making progress against Barack Obama, would talk about cutting the gas tax. Uh, and, and it worked in a lot of uh, Midwest uh, states. In, in that election, it's worked for other presidents as well. But I, I, wanna, I wanna step back a little bit here and, and follow up on what Claire was just talking about, uh, about learning from last Tuesday. We talked last week about the New York Times uh, uh, editorial uh, and their analysis of the <laughs> Democrats' loss in Virginia's governor's race. And the editorial board said the party risks losing uh, the voters it gained from Republicans if it doesn't seek a more moderate course. This morning, uh, the Wall Street Journal's William Goldson is giving his take in a new piece titled The Democratic Guide to Losing Elections. He writes, in part, the New York Times stayed notably silent on the issue that arguably made the biggest difference in Virginia's gubernatorial contest, namely teaching about race and ethnicity in public schools. In three easy steps, the defeated Democratic candidates showed how not to deal with it. First, tell parents to butt out and leave the matter to experts. Second, infuriate parents by telling them uh, that they are confused and there's no real problem. And finally, accuse Republican candidates of blowing a racist dog whistle. In effect, Terry McAuliffe accused Virginia voters who responded to Glenn Youngkin's uh, 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 of being racist. Goldston continues, the bottom line is time for Democrats to get serious about the problems they've created for themselves in decades-long drifts towards cultural progressivism that repels the voters they need to build a national majority. And, uh, you know, John Heilman, obviously, there are not a lot of Democrats that are going to go to the Wall Street Journal editorial page uh, to, to get guidance on how to run <laughs> their next election. Uh, but they should, uh, leaders should look at the New York Times from last week uh, and, and the Wall Street Journal, this editorial from this week, and look at them side to side. Take them to heart, because there's one thing that I really took out of this Wall Street Journal editorial, and this is it. I constantly have people, constantly have people saying, what happened to the party? What happened to conservatives? Why did they move towards Donald Trump? And as a guy that grew up in, you know, the suburbs of Atlanta, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, upstate New York, part of upstate New York, that went all Trump, I can tell you it was just this constant feeling that people were being looked down upon by the national media, by the national parties. If you want to piss off parents, there are two great ways to do it. One, well, are three great ways to do it. One, <laughs> tell them not to be interested, not to get involved in their kids' school. Uh, two, uh, call them racist if, if they support a candidate that you disagree with. And three, and I think this is most important and something that's overlooked, tell them that what they think they're seeing in their children's school is not real that you know better about what's going on in their children's eighth grade classroom from your perch in New York or Manhattan or Los Angeles than they do.
And that's exactly what keeps happening. You go on Twitter, oh, this is not real. I'm not talking about critical race theory in general. I'm talking, though, about this growing concern from parents. You can call them racists if you want to lose, and you can say that what they're complaining about or what they're, what they're seeing is not real. But Virginia showed us that's the pathway to disaster and a pathway to Kevin McCarthy being speaker and a pathway to Donald Trump being reelected in 24. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.